had it for an, over an hour just the other day. And he just shared this awesome theme that you guys are, are, are looking at this year as a church, as a family. Build your house. Build your house. And he said that is building the kingdom of God as well as your personal house. Amen. And so today I want to speak just into this idea of building altars. Building altars, pitching tents, and digging wells. Can we all say altars? Altars. And you know, there's an old saying called an altar call. For those of us that have been around church for many years, we'll know the word altar call. And I believe that God is literally calling his people, calling you and me, back to the altar. Back to a place of surrender, sacrifice, and meeting with him. Amen. He's calling us away from all the other distractions in our lives, and He's calling us back to the altar. I want to encourage you today that, um, and there's a picture of an altar. Oh, it's already up. Andrew and the team, you guys are too sharp. I need to actually send my my production team here for some training, midweek training. Okay, and... um, Just by being here today, just by coming to fellowship, connecting, staying connected, and you know, I was so blessed this morning as I looked around, I just saw regular faces, faces that come Sunday after Sunday, maybe some of you it's your first Sunday, I want to encourage you, make this a habit, make it part of your life, and coming to church today, what you've done is that you have actually brought a rock, and you've placed it and you've built an altar. That's what you've done today. And I want to say, well done, church, for being here. Just being here today, you've built an altar. And listen to this. An altar represents, or or the description of an altar is a place of slaughter. Okay, we're not going to slaughter anybody today. Okay, that's, that's good news. But it's a place of sacrifice, surrender, consecration, thanksgiving, worship, But it's also a place of encounter and a place that God creates. God creates in two places mainly, in the womb and secondly at the altar. And so as we come today, as we come to church and and we come and worship and we connect, God literally will create in you a new mind and a new heart. He'll give you, you'll be sitting in a church service or worshiping, God can give you a creative business idea like that in his presence. And and I want to say online, and this is very, online is not necessarily building an altar. I'll say that carefully because there are people watching for whatever reason and it's good. But there's something about being in the place, amen? There's something about being in the atmosphere of people worshiping God as you as you come to the altar that God creates. And if we're not getting into that place, and if we're not building altars in our lives, don't be surprised if your, your spirituality, your joy, your, your very life starts diminishing. You, but as we come to the altar, God wants to actually do, He wants to encounter us. And I've been challenged in this area to start encountering God again, starting to come to the altar, and not just pitching tents. And what do I mean by that? Genesis 13 verse 18, we read just one of many verses where we read about Abraham that he built altars and he pitched tents. Listen to this. Genesis 13 verse 18 says, Abraham built altars and pitched tents throughout his life. Let me just, sorry, I don't think that's the version... So Abraham went to live near the great trees of Ma- at Hebron, where he pitched his tents. Let's read together. There he built an altar to the Lord. The second verse that I just want to read is Genesis 26, a couple of chapters later, verse 25. And this is speaking about his son, Isaac. Listen to what his son did. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent And there his servants dug a well. Isn't that incredible that Abraham modeled building altars and pitching tents? That that was their lifestyle. And because as dad, he had done that, what did his son do? His son copied. 
He followed on. Friends, I want to encourage you as families, set an example of building altars in your family. Because guess what? What one generation tolerates, another generation will celebrate. So if we tolerating not going to church, what is the next generation going to do? They're going to celebrate not going to church. They're going to, they're going to live life to the full of not walking and operating in God's things. And I'm telling you, there's so, so much pressure to give up. There's so much um, attack to give up building altars. And I know for one, I'm, I'm preaching to myself, I have in areas stopped building altars. And I've just been all about pitching tents. The altar speaks of the eternal. The tent speaks of the temporary. And if you're anything like me, I chase that tent every day. I get up, here's a tent right here. Who can relate? I wake up in the morning, the first, this thing charges next to my bed. The first thing I do is I, I hit snooze about six times. You guys don't do that. I'm obviously the only one. A disciplined crowd here. Okay. After I've hit snooze a few times, I read, check my emails. I mean, I'm still in bed. Check my emails, check my WhatsApp, check my Instagram. Why? Because I just want to make sure there's, there's nothing I'm missing. But let me tell you, as you pitch that tent for the day, your whole day, the direction of your day, will stem and flow from that place of not building an altar. I want to encourage and challenge us, start this week, start building an altar in the morning. Get up, leave your phone, go make some coffee, and spend 5, 10, 15 minutes. And it might be a bit strange if, if you don't do this often. It might be a bit strange. How do I have a quiet time? You know what the best thing to do is just go sit without your phone. And it's hard, eh? It's very difficult. And try not take your phone with you, because I tell you what, this thing, hey, you get distracted. And I'm not saying just listen to the Bible app, read the Bible app, because halfway through the Bible app, I'm going to my WhatsApps and getting distracted already anyway, and I, I don't even remember. It's time to build an altar again, because if we build an altar in the morning, our day will flow from having surrendered to God, having come into, Lord, I'm, sick, I'm, I'm offering, I'm surrendering this day to you, God. Before, I want to focus on my tent and digging wells. And the tent speaks of our families. It speaks of our lives. The Bible actually says we are living in a temporary tent. Okay? It actually calls our lives a temporary tent. And wells speak of our business. What do we do every day? What is our occupation to, to pay the bills? And, and so often, we've got the three reversed. We're digging wells flat out we 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 tending to our tent and to our family and to our possessions, and then God is coming third, like once a week. And so well done for being out today. It's at least you are building an altar today, but we are called to build an altar every day. And to make the altar the place of sacrifice, the place of surrender, the place of seeking God. We are called to make that priority. And if we want to build the kingdom and build our lives. We best be building altars. God is calling us to the altar, an altar call. Old-fashioned word, but I'll tell you what, a, a powerful truth. Amen? And so I just want to quickly recount a story about a tent. Um, when I was younger, not that I'm old, um, I mean, in eternity I'm Still a spring chicken. I tell 80-year-olds and 90-year-olds, I just encourage them. I say, you're a spring chicken in eternity, man. You know, We're going to live forever. And how cool is that? As Christians, we, we actually don't die. Remember that, eh? The body dies, but we, we live. We live forever. And many years ago, God gave me a vision of a festival Christian music festival and so I started that festival and it ran for 10 years out there in Ashburton who of you ever came to one of those it was called Just Jesus Session yes oh awesome and uh, it was a, a wonderful season of just where, where many people gathered and worshipped into the new year the one year I remember we we had the tent set up and this was a huge tent it was a 2000 seater very big tent and 
I had been chasing and running and stressed out, trying to make, pull everything together. And it was about, it was actually, I think, Christmas Eve. The tent had already been set up in Ashburton. And a massive storm hit that weekend. And I remember us being at home as a family and we're watching the trees sway. And this, one of those massive Maritzburg storms, just blowing. The wind was so strong. And I remember thinking to myself, dear Lord, please let that tent be standing. And now here's, a, here's an interesting thing. Building up to that festival, almost every year, a few months before the festival, I would have this one dream. I'm not, I'm not a big dreamer, but, but you know people tell you they have a recurring dream. I had, this was one recurring dream that I'd have, a few months, normally about two to three months. And I would dream that I had arrived at the festival by myself. I was there. The tent was still down on the ground. And there was the, a band standing there with their instruments saying, we playing at, at eight o'clock. And I would be standing there, and there were one or two people trying to light a fire for the catering. This is a dream that I had. And I'd be thinking to myself in the dream, why didn't I organize this festival better, you know? And, and the odd car would be driving into park, and these families getting out, and they're looking, here's a tent on the ground. And so what I would do in the dream is I'd get under the tent, this massive tent, top, tall and heavy, and there I was by myself trying to pull up like an like a eight-meter pole. And I'd be thinking to myself, why didn't I organize this? You know, well, surely I should have organized a team or something to put this tent up. And, I'm kicking. and I'd wake up from the dream, and i tell you what, that day I would just make things happen. I would get things organized, and it was like God's way of saying, listen, get on. Anyway, fast forward to this, this, this storm that we had. After the storm, I drove up uh, with, with my friend, I said, let's, let's go look and see if there's any damage on the tent. This is real life now, no more dreaming. And we drove up, and in the distance, I could see a crumpled tent lying on the ground. No, you, know, you know how beautiful that big tent looks? If you would have driven past in the entry, you'd see those, those big sections. I think there was about 10 domes, you know, and just beautiful. I couldn't see any beautiful domes. I could just see a crumpled thing on the ground. Drove in and it was like my dream was getting lived out. That whole tent had been taken out by that storm, lying on the ground. And I'm thinking to myself, the, I phoned the guy. He says, listen, Grant, I've gone away for two weeks on holiday. The guy that, now this is not a tent that you and your family can pitch for a weekend at Midmark. <laughs> this is a tent that requires 20 staff mem trained staff members, special machinery. And I'm thinking, dear Lord, what has happened here? Anyway, fortunately, that, that gentleman had a team sort of on, back, on, on standby that he sent, and they were able to re-put that tent up. But I'll tell you what. I le God spoke to me. He said, Grant, it's become all about the tent. And I want this weekend, this festival, to be about me. You've stopped seeking my face. And God humbled me in that moment. And sometimes God will do that. He will blow your little tent over to get you back to the altar. Amen. He'll let your wind little tent blow away to show you again that our trust is not in our tent or our wells, but our trust needs to be in Him. He is the eternal one. He's the one with the plan. He's the one with the peace, the joy that we need, the courage that we need in this life. And uh, if I tell you what, we so easily run after that tent. Isn't that true? And I'm sure many of you can tell us stories today about how your, God used your tent to blow over. And God will continue. Every now and again, He'll do that to make you realize it's not about the tent. And, and can we enjoy the tent? Absolutely. Is the tent there to enjoy and, and have fun? Absolutely. To, is it nice to have a little cottage down the beach? Yes, I don't have one, um, but my, my in-laws do, and I get to enjoy that. But if that becomes your altar, that means you, and you, you stop offering 
worship to God, now you're building tents and pitching altars. The roles get reversed. It's so easy to start building tents. Amen? And so, you know, you can be there on the golf course and, and enjoying your holiday and everything like that, and, and you can say, no, no, it's fine. This, I'm worshiping God, but you start missing out on church. Hey, you got a new 4x4 four four now. you got a new boat. You, the tent can so easily distract us. The temporary can distract us. Friends, be careful that that thing doesn't replace God and doesn't replace building altars. I hope that this is speaking to somebody like it's spoken to me. And so God taught me in that moment of that tent collapsing that I need to trust in him. I need to get back to building an altar. And that very, the following days building up to the festival, I started getting things in place again. I started getting back to praying in the morning because I was too busy with running the festival, doing God a favor that I forgot God and he needed to bring me back. And, and so fast forward to the actual festival that year and the main band is playing. There's almost 2,000 people. It's rocking. It's rocking like urban light on a Sunday morning. It's going. The bass was pumping. It was awesome. And I'm just standing there in awe and I'm just standing at the back, and there's just people worshiping. And that we, we ran the festival off a generator. And the main band is playing, and we're building up to midnight, and these guys were quite well known. And suddenly, there's just a blackout. And you know, there weren't even outages happening then, but we had an outage there. Boom. Everything's gone, and you just hear the drummer drumming. But the sound system's gone, the lights are gone, 2,000 people standing in darkness. Yo. And I had a choice. Lord, do I trust in you or do I start panicking? Hey, God started working around the generator. There was about tw suddenly 20 engineers. Everybody was an engineer. Everybody knew the answer, how to get this generator working. And uh, all the pilots were there trying to fly this thing again. And I tell you what, in that moment, you see, God had humbled me a week before, and I'd gone back to building an altar. And in that moment, 2,000 people forgot about the famous band on stage, and they started building an altar. They started worshiping without music, without lights. The lead singer found that, that loud hailer, and he started singing. You know those loud hailers? They're a bit scratchy. He, he started singing this little loud of mine with a loud hailer. Then guys had their phones on, and then some camper, some bright spark, he brought his floodlight, I don't know how many million lumen, and he put this thing on, Doo! and that whole tent lit up. There's a camper. There's everybody worshiping God, just going crazy without the tent, without the generator, the stuff. And so God did it with me, an individual. A week later, what did he do? With 2,000 people, he again said, I'm going to shake the tent so that this weekend there'll be an altar built. Hallelujah. And it was so beautiful. I tell you what, the presence of God moved. And for about 45 minutes to an hour, we worshiped, danced, praised without anything. Just us, God's people, and God. And to this day, people talk about that experience when the generator broke. And so it's okay when the tent breaks in our lives. It's okay. God is calling us back to an altar of seeking him and knowing him intimately, not just chasing everything else that we think we need to make this life work. We need one thing, friends, and that's a relationship, a passionate relationship with God, a love story where he becomes our all again. Amen. Building altars, pitching tents, and digging wells. You know, I'll, I'm a butcher by trade. Um, that, that's my, my background, working with meat. And uh, who enjoys a, a, a good bra? Yeah, we enjoy, oh, there's some good, yeah, awesome. I mean, that, talk about building altars, hey? Us South Africans, a bra is an altar, I'm telling you. Hey? The smoke goes up, the sweet aroma. And um, I had this analogy once, and, and I actually... I wanted to do it this morning, but I didn't. The one Sunday, many years ago, I spoke on 
sacrifice, and I actually did a bra in the church. Hey, the front row guys, they couldn't concentrate, uh, the smoke, so I thought, no, we won't do a bra today. Um, Pastor Julian won't invite me back again. Um, but isn't it, just consider this thought. What is your favorite meat? Let's, let's get some, this side? But what kind of, sorry, what breed of meat? What animal? Shout out this side. Are you vegetarians? Okay, let me move here. Sorry, vegans and vegetarians. What, 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 what kind of meat? Beef, chicken, lamb? I'm hearing lamb. Okay, I'm going to go with, and beef, there's some beef lovers here, lamb, okay, this side? Cool, no vegetarians here, eh? just that side. Okay, I'm going to ignore those guys for the Lord be with them. The Lord will rev- he'll give you revelation, don't worry. <laughs> um, so let's go with a lamb. So if you see a nice lamb out in the field, and you go up to it with your knife and fork, and your, your, your favorite spice, okay? And you go up there, and you, your, your, your friend or your, your, your spouse or child holds this lamb, and you spice that, uh, the, the, the rump, the rump. You spice it, or beef, you, whatever animal you want to. You guys, I don't know, maybe a cucumber, I don't know. <laughs> um, and and you, you spice that thing there, and you, you, you try to cut it, and, and you manage to cut a piece out of this live animal, then you chow it. How nice is it going to be? You guys don't do that, eh? Generally, we don't. Correct. But you take that thing and you take the animal through the process of an abattoir, a butcher, cauldrons, etc. And you eventually get it to your fridge or freezer and then onto a bra. And then you bra that thing, cook it nicely, spice it. How nice is it then? In fact, last night I had a bra. We had some lamb chops and amazing. Beautiful. I love being South. This is the best country to live in, eh? Nobody else bras like South Africa. Don't leave because the bras are not cool. They're not as nice. No, we're near. I've lived there. I've lived in the UK, eh? You battle, man. They come with their patties and their sausages. That's about it. There's no meat. And um, so therein lies the difference of sacrificing your life. Laying your life, your desires down on the altar, okay? When we're living here, away from the altar, we're living for ourselves, in our own strength, our own selfishness, we're living here, far away from the altar, actually, and we're striving to make our lives good. We're striving here in our own strength, trying to spice our lives, trying to carry on. The truth of the matter is, number one, we won't be a sweet aroma to God. And actually, we think we're being a sweet, but we're not going to be sweet tasting, actually. So we try harder, we try different things. It's not going to work. What God wants is men and women that will lay their lives down at the altar, okay? And say, God, here I am. Take me. I'm laying my desires, my rights, my thoughts, my opinions. Who's got opinions? Hey, we've got plenty of opinions in the world today. My, my things, the way I think, my pride, I'm laying them down on the altar, Lord, today. I bring my, even my will. I lay it down. Jesus will take that. Father will take that, that life of surrender. And as we do that, what happens? A sweet taste starts happening, okay? I want to encourage us, friends. The world needs to see a people, a church, that are building altars, that we lay our lives down for the sake of the kingdom. That's when in marriage, husband and wife, you are called to lay your life down. And that's, that's I know in my marriage when things get a little bit... Uh, you know when things aren't hunky-dory, yeah? it's not, not sweet tasting, is when I want something and I'm not getting it, then I respond in a certain way. Isn't that true? We are called to lay our lives down for each other. And when we operate in that again, when we want the best for our spouse, and let me tell you, I don't get this right, but I'm working on it. My wife gets it much more right than I do. Um, and she sends her love, by the way, but she's 
involved at church today. When we get that right, when we serve each other, I'll tell you what, things go a lot better. When I start living to see her have the better, things start changing. And that goes, I think, for all of life. Just very quickly, in closing today, I want to leave us with six, just six areas where we can build an altar. Number one, in, in our brokenness. In our brokenness. It's God of grace. It's so amazing. You can be broken. You can be mourning. You can be your heart broken. In that place, it's, this is the mystery of grace. God will build allow you to build an altar. Isn't that beautiful? At our lowest, at our heart, those are some of the most amazing altar times in our brokenness. So I want to encourage anybody this morning that's broken, God is, he's going to allow you, you, you know, and this is the incredible thing about brokenness, we don't even have to necessarily bring the rocks to build the altar. Just by being there, you're in a place of vulnerability, that's sometimes where God is the closest to us. And I'm sure we can all testify to the brokenness in our lives. And so don't always try to have everything together. Sometimes it's good to allow yourself to be weak and broken so that there you can meet with God. Number two, as we commit to community, as we commit our lives and our family, and we say we're going to be part of the urban life community, I'm going to be part of, I'm giving everything in, not just once a week, but I'm committing to be accountable to be uh, involved, give of my giftings, get involved, my finances. Let us give. Let us be committed to community. Number three, as we model a life of faith. When we live by faith instead of fear, we build an altar. The tent and the well is often connected to fear. Because why? Because it's temporary. We get fearful. I'm going to lose this stuff. Don't be fearful. Be a man and woman of faith. Let faith arise. Amen. You build an altar every time. You say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm trusting your word. Let faith arrive, arise, arrive and arise and replace fear. Amen. Number four, we build an altar when we practice forgiveness. The Lord's prayer says, Lord, forgive me as I forgive others. Can you see how forgiveness has to... That's what the beautiful Lord's Prayer that we all, many of us know. But we need to practice that. Lord, forgive me, my trespasses, my sin, as I forgive those that have trespassed against me. First year, friends, we need to recognize that we, we have been greatly forgiven. And we need to pass forgiveness on greatly. We need, to, we need to let go of some things. And set yourself and the person free. And build an altar. Every time we forgive, an altar is built. Number five, when I'm generous. I want to encourage us, and I know that many of you are already, but we are blessed to be a blessing, Genesis 12. We are blessed to be a blessing. And that is, it's not about the size or the the monetary value or how, it's a heart. Generosity is a heart condition. I've got a hundred rand to give, I'm going to give it. I've got a million rand to give, I'm going to give it. And everybody said, Amen. (laughs) <laughs> a gener- when we are generous you know as Christians we should be known for the best tippers at restaurants the, the waiters and waitresses should rush to get to us because we tip generously amen and that's a small thing but think about this Abraham right through his life he built altars and pitched tents and when it came for the big one an altar for his own son he did it. Why? Because he had been practicing the small altars. Right through his life, it was a way of life to surrender to God, to seek God, to say, God, I'm letting go. This is yours. When it came time to let go of his only son, I'm going to do it, God. He's yours. Because he had, he had, he had learned, he had, he, he had seen God encounter him at the place of the altar every time. And why would it be different this time? And so he said, God, I'm going to let my son go because he'd been practicing in the small. And so I want to encourage you guys, give. Even if it's small, give. Because when, when those big um, dream Sundays come or vision Sundays, it'll be easier to give. 
Give of your time. Take some people out for coffee because God might want you to plant a church one day where you're going to have to be, have a big coffee machine for a lot of people. Amen? And so we, we, we build altars in the small. And finally, we build an altar every time we fix our eyes on Jesus. Every time we focused on Jesus, there's an altar that will be built. Why? Because when we fix our eyes on Jesus, he was, the cross was the ultimate altar. And look what came from that altar of him giving his life. Look what came. Freedom to us. Forgiveness. Life forevermore. Hope. Joy. Amen. Wonderful. Let us, let us just stand this morning.